<laughs> Praise the Lord. We're in Colossians. <laughs> I don't know what your day's been like, but it's been interesting for me. It's been a wonder and a delight to find out what it is that God would take that I was learning from and apply it in my life today as I went through my day. And as it turned out, I took a nap. <laughs> I'll talk about that later in another video, but boy, when I take a nap, sometimes I take a nap. And that's kind of what God wants us to be like, is to not be so caught up in our schedules or in our plans or in our rushing around and being always in a hurry. Are you in a hurry? Do you have a time schedule that you have to keep to? Do you have things in your life that make you do the things you do? Do you find yourself being controlled by your schedule? Lots of times in life it's easy to get caught up with the things of the world than to be listening to what God might say to you. My prayer for you today is that you might listen carefully to what God might say. Because just like me, I know what it's like to be caught up in the busy schedule that we all have. Each one of us think we have to do certain things. Each one of us get caught up by doing things we probably shouldn't be doing. Some of us even get caught up into sins that we shouldn't be committing. I mean, that's kind of what it's like to have to live in this body of flesh that we literally live in. I mean, I know for myself that if you leave me alone for five minutes, uh-oh, trouble, keep me on the leash, Lord. I don't want to be left alone. You see, I would rather have the consciousness of Jesus always in my life than to ever go any part of my day without being aware that God is inside me. Because knowing that God is inside me, knowing that He lives and breathes and has His being inside of me, boy, I tell you, when I commit sin, it makes me feel bad. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I feel so bad, I confess it right away. Lord, God, forgive me. Oh, man, did I blow it. You know, and I'm sorry, Lord, but, you know, until you make me perfect, I'm imperfect. And that's kind of what we have to keep in perspective. Not that we should sin more, but when sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So there'll be times and seasons that you go through where it's kind of like really hard to put on the full armor of God and be, you know, this big old saint that you think you got to be. God knows better. God loves you. God died for you. And that's kind of what Colossians is all about. Colossians is all about reminding us that, hey, guess what? God is taking care of it. He has reconciled all things unto himself, and he has made a way that we can be forgiven. I mean, for me, that's such a freeing experience. It's like, oh, God, thank God I can be forgiven. If I couldn't be forgiven for the things I've done, huh, I might as well kill myself. I mean, literally, because, quite frankly, I tried. <laughs> I wanted to be a Marine so bad. How bad did you want to be a Marine? Oh, buddy, let me tell you. I was in boot camp, and Sergeant Morningstar, he was our drill instructor, and he inspired us because it was during the time of Vietnam when everybody wanted to go to the war and fight for their country, you know, kind of like the patriotic thing. No, not in this country. As a matter of fact, when I was enlisted, and I wasn't enlisted, but when I enlisted, because I would have been enlisted by the government, draft was going on, everybody hated the war. Matter of fact, everybody hated the veterans. Matter of fact, everybody hated the Army. They hated the Army, the National Guard, the Marines, the Air Force, you name it. Anybody with a uniform, this country hated. And that wasn't that long ago. I remember I was there. But I wanted to join, you know, because I thought, well, you know, it's my patriotic duty. And I'd read all these silly patriotic books, you know, about, oh, being John Wayne, you know, and that was kind of what was out there at the time brainwashed by television, and I was one of those kind of kids, you know. Yeah, I want to go out and kill them. Yeah, I want to shoot somebody. Uh -huh, that's me. I want to do it. Yeah, I'll shoot them. And so we had this drill instructor that was teaching us, and then finally he left. He was transferred out, and then a guy, a veteran from Vietnam, had just got off the plane, and he was taken over. He stripped us naked, stacked us up in the shower room, and made us all stand like, you know, and then swear allegiance to the gun, you know, that this is, this is my 
weapon and this is my gun. One is for pleasure and one is for fun. Or one is for killing and one is for fun. And Then he made us swear that we would kill and become bloodthirsty savages to kill the enemy. And just went on and on and on and on. Well, God told me, get out. I didn't. So I got sick. <laughs> oh, well. And I really wanted to be a Marine. I mean, boy, can I tell you, I fought it and I fought to stay in. And well, you know, long story short, they gave me an honorable medical discharge before I ever got a chance to kill somebody. I really wanted to. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was more than Semper Fi. I was gung ho. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, thank God that God spared me of those things. Because really, just like in Colossians, we're going to see today, God doesn't want you out killing things. He wants you saving things. Matter of fact, he doesn't want you destroying people's lives. He wants you encouraging people's lives. He doesn't want you to have a life that is so in bondage to the world and its ways. He wants you to free you up today to the glory and the beauty that's all around you that he created from the beginning of the world and the beginning of time. He said, this is my daughter. This is my son. This is whom I have chosen to experience what I've created for them. Oh, I can't wait to watch and see how they're going to react to it. Just like a father and a mother looks over their children and watches to see how they're going to play in what they've made for them. That's the way your father is for you. That's the way God loves you. That's the way our God is about our salvation. He's provided for us. That's why I'm so glad God forgives us. Because if God didn't forgive us, baby, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> dude, you know what I'm saying. Because, dude, you're just as bad as I am. Come on now. Be real. Let's get real about it. Yeah. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And thank God for Pepsi. <laughs> Because if it wasn't for Pepsi, I'd be an alcoholic. <laughs> but in and of itself, we can't do this by ourselves. And that's one of the things that Colossians wants to remind us. It's not about what we can do, but it's about what He has done. It's not about how we choose to live our lives, but how God is working out His salvation in us so that out from us would come the means with which we could affect other people's lives. Because if we've been forgiven, oh wow, then we can go out and help others to be forgiven too. And that's kind of what Colossians is about. We looked at first Colossians and we didn't get very far. We kind of went through the chapter, you know, we experienced a lot of things. Learning about the will of God and learning about Paul and learning about the saints and the faithful brethren. But it's kind of interesting to me that in reading in chapter 2 where we're at today, we're looking at something that we're going to do that we might want to slow down a little bit because as we go quickly through, sometimes we miss some of the things that are important that we need to do. Like listen, think about, consider, ponder. So we might slow this down from chapter to chapter to maybe two or three points in a chapter sometimes. Maybe, maybe break it up into thirds or something, depending upon what the section's like. So we may not go through the entire chapter tonight, and we may have to just kind of like take it in pieces, but I'll tell you, one of the nice things about taking it easy is <sighs> you're taking it easy. <laughs> so get a cup of coffee, get a Pepsi, get something to eat, relax, take it easy, God loves you. You don't got to be beat up, it's not like you got to go grow up real fast, you're going to grow anyways. You're just going to grow up smarter if you do it his way than you do it your way. So let's just enjoy for a moment a sip of Pepsi. No, but seriously, let's enjoy for a moment a thought and some introspection, a consideration, if you will, maybe a conversation with God as we pray for this study, that we might be thankful and glad for what God has done. Because if it was up to us, we'd have messed it up already. If it was really a part of our plan, we would have already been condemned and cast out and never once come back to Christianity or follow Jesus as we know we should. But because Jesus doesn't push us away, because Jesus doesn't cast us aside, because God has called us, he's also given us his spirit to comfort us. Because there's a time and a place where we will feel rejected and dejected. We'll feel like the abstract of God rather than the intention of God. We'll feel as though we're not God's perfection, but we are definitely man's imperfection. 
And I know I feel like that all the time. <laughs> Fortunately, I have to do all this ministry stuff because I'm such a sinner. No, I'm kidding. I don't do this out of guilt. I do it because I enjoy it. Are you kidding? I'm loving it, man. I'm digging it. I'm doing what I want to do. I am enjoying life to the fullest because I have found my place in His unending grace. And all that I do now is to please Him face to face so that when I see Him, I will kiss the Son lest He be angry. I will enjoy the presence of God in my life so that I can rejoice with you. I can give voice to the things I'm thankful for. I can lift up the name of Jesus and be satisfied that His salvation has come in my life and I know that I'm going home. That whether I be raptured or whether I go into the tribulation, whether I be dying tomorrow or today while I'm recording, I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going to be absent from this body. Thank God. Cut the nose off. Woo! First thing to go. But I'll be present with the Lord. And oh, forevermore, I'll never be alone. And neither will you. Father, I thank you for today. That this is the uh, thank you for that Pepsi. Oh boy, good belch. Excuse me, that's not nice. You shouldn't be doing that on videos or in church. <laughs> but God, I thank you that you're with us always, so you see everything, our most embarrassing moments to our most holy moments. That God, even a good bow movement can be a holy moment for some people. But God, I don't pray for only my wife, but I pray for all those others who likewise at that age feel like that's a holy moment. But God, I do pray that we can have the joy of the Lord, that we can have the peace of God, that we can have your spirit that gives us the ability to relax, to be still, to know you, to experience you in a personal, intimate way. Because Jesus, that's what we want. We don't want to be the smartest kid on the block or the dumbest. We don't really want to be you know, the guy that got left behind. But God, whatever you decide, well, that's just fine with us. We just want to know that whatever we don't know, you'll take care of. And whatever we can't do, you'll do. Because God, we just want to find you today. We want to hear your voice today. And we want to walk in your will today. So God, today, while it's called today, help us to listen, to hear, to see, and to understand what the Spirit of God is teaching us. Because God, we're all in this together. You are in us, and we're in you, and you prayed for us, and we're praying for you, and you're at the seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us, and we're interceding on behalf of people around us, and I'm praying for the people that are watching, and they're praying for me that I get on with it. <laughs> and that, God, we would just be all like you and your Father and the Spirit is. We would all be one. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I... Look forward to these times that we have together. I enjoy them because I employ them in my life. In other words, I expect when I record these things to hear from God. That means to employ someone. If I, if I have a job for someone to do, I want them to do it. I pay them a certain amount of money for them to do it. So when I say that I employ these moments, I expect the Spirit of God to get right down in it to get right to it and work on me, to come at me and tell me, hey, you know, this is what I'm saying to you, dude. You listen. And I'm going, oh, okay. And I'm speaking and I'm going, wow, I sound so wise. Boy, if they only knew the truth. We won't tell anybody, will we? It's not me speaking with the Lord. <laughs> I'm no genius, believe me. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not the genius here. But the Spirit of God will inspire your personality as he does mine. He will conspire the circumstances of your life to use them so that you have a story to tell. He will inspire the way that you talk about, walk about, and share the things of life that you're experiencing so that you would be a living witness, a living testimony. That just like in the Old Testament, it wasn't all bad stories. As a matter of fact, if you saw the greatest heroes of the Bible, they all had good sides and bad sides. They all had good experiences and bad experiences. That's what you are. You're God's greatest hero of the Bible. Yeah, today, right now. You are the one that God has chosen to be the focus of his attention while he's watching you and causing his face to shine upon you. 
He's watching and seeing that you will do according to what he wants you to do. So you'll be blessed. Because rather than be your God, he's also your father. So let's look in the word today and see what he has to say for us. But he's speaking to me. So we're starting in chapter 2 of Colossians. And I'm going to flip over here in Colossians in the big book. Because sometimes it's hard for me to read this little book. Because I kind of looked at it and went, okay, well, you know, that's kind of small print. You know, so I'll set it over there and kind of get rid of it. And kind of stick over here with my Pepsi and read the big book. Because I'm going blind. <laughs> I need better glasses. So in Colossians chapter 2, it says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Jesus, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I think that's where we're going to stop. Because in verse 3 it says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joyfully beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have received of Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding wherein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, and after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, for in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. So I would say verse 1 to 10 would be like a segment that we could look at, but I wanted to kind of break this down a little smaller, because... I wanted to, I just felt like God was trying to say something to me today about assurance. And looking at verses 1 through, well, I'll say 4. We'll read that again and we'll, we'll look at that particular segment, that section. Because in fact of matter, the way that the Bible is written isn't in chapters and verses. Now, I know it, you're saying, well, yes, they are. And I'm saying, no, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. No, they're not. Yeah, 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 no. No, seriously. <laughs> it wasn't until, well, I guess the 1700s that there were chapters and verses put in. Normally, what happened was that sages and scribes would sit down and part of their religious tradition would be to write and record the Bible. We'll call it the Bible. In the old days, if you were just part of the Jewish tradition, Jewish family, if you were Jewish and you were in Judaism, then a scribe would record the Torah. That was his job, his function as a religious, part of a religious order. He would be like a monk. You know, you can think of monks in the Catholic tradition. That's what a scribe was in the Jewish tradition. Some scribes became legalists and became into law and became lawyers. So you could say in the modern day, Jewish lawyers are scribes. And it works pretty much that way. But in Christianity today, we see things a little bit differently. You know, we see that we have Bibles that are broken up into chapters and verses. And a lot of times people memorize chapter and verse and they want to have a location so they can look at where they're talking from the scriptures because they're worried about arguing or debating scriptures. And unfortunately, the way it was originally started was that in the Bible, the first recording press was a man named Gutenberg, which was in Germany at the time, and he had started what was called the printing press. And the printing press was the ability to take this solvent ink that was black and to embed it into the same way that this ink was used with a quill in order to write. He had come up with the idea we could imprint it. So as opposed to inscribing, which is to take a quill and to scribe it or to scrib it or to cut it into the paper with ink to bleed into the paper, he found that he could just impress it by pressing in with a metallic ink or a metallic plate or a wood plate, as sometimes they were used, and he could make a imprint on that paper that came out the same way that a scribal art would take and cut into the paper or scribe into it with ink and quill. And that's what feather pens used to do, was that they would kind of scribe, and that's why there's indentation in some ways, or there's 
scribing in, and it's called inscribed. That's why in the Torah it says in Deuteronomy that you know you should make no graven images because you are engraving, so to speak, when you write. And in some ways, you know, you could say that the written word of God could become an idol. As a matter of fact, in Judaism, the Torahs have become idols. I mean, there is a sect in Judaism that today worships the Torah. They will pick it up, they'll kiss it, you know, they'll open it up, they'll roll it up, they'll die for it, they'll fight for it, they'll, you know, act like that one scroll is more important than life. And they will literally tell you it is. It's not. It's kind of like when the Catholics got so carried away with the, the blood and the wine, you know, and the whole idea of trying to say that the wine becomes blood and that the transubstantiation is what it's called, the transmutation of the elements, meaning that wine that they're using for a ceremony suddenly becomes real blood, you know, when you drink it and when somewhere in your throat it suddenly becomes transformed, that um, once it's blessed it goes in and it changes the rest, you know, that um, that somehow becomes blood and that little wafer that they really messed up when they made it white, I don't know what they're doing with it, but anyways, I don't know what they do with that wafer, where it came from, it doesn't even look like anything human, I don't even know how you could consume it. But that little wafer, and no, no offense to Catholics, I mean, you know, whatever you put your faith in is what you put your faith in. But, you know, God bless you. You know, I mean, I understand. I just don't mean spiritual you suck to, you know. But um, the wafer, likewise, to be the transmutation, transubstantiation of that wafer into flesh is to eat his flesh. Because Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what... The Catholic doctrine was was to believe that it became that in physical form rather than just in the spiritual realm. Which we know that in heaven you could see a bowl poured out, and guess what? When that pool, when that bowl gets poured out down on earth, guess what happens from the physical, from the spiritual realm to the physical realm? All hell breaks loose. Well, so in in heaven, the Catholics are right. It does literally. If they take a cup of wine in heaven and bless it, it will be blood. You look in there and it'll be blood, believe me. It won't be, you know, like grape juice. No, uh -uh. <laughs> Sorry, don't bless it then. <laughs> because you're drinking blood. Ew. Vampires eat your heart out in heaven you get to. But in the bread too, it would be the physical blood, bread. If it was so happening in heaven. But it didn't happen in heaven. It happened on earth. And so the spiritual body would not be dying there. But the transmutation would have been accomplished there in the heavenlies. So... They had the right idea, but they had the wrong location, in a way. And that's why Jews, in some ways, worshipped the Torah, because it was used with the hands. The hands handled that with which was life. They handled the Word of God. They inscribed it with every ounce of meticulous detail that they could see and feel and emote into that writing when they were doing it. And the scribe had to have that kind of emotion where he was putting his kavanah, his attitude of his heart. He had to speak into it. He had to worship it. He had to have such a delight in the word that he would, whew, with one stroke of the pen, it would be the yud. And with another stroke of the pen, it would be another form of the letter. And the Torah was written that way. And so at first, it was a delight. In thy law I delight day and night, and I meditate on it. When I rise up, when thou sittest down, when thou goest forth, when thou eatest, when thou drinkest, when thou sleepest. And so the Jew, at one point in time, knew what to do. Sadly, it became a vain tradition when it became strapped to the head. It became imprinted upon the little scroll that's stuck in the box. It says, this is what you should do. And unfortunately, it's about as far from your mind as it's going to be. Because guess what? It's going to give you a headache, but it's sure ain't going to remind you to read the Bible. And same thing with strapping it around your hands. It's supposed to be to use the Word of God, not to confuse it by wrapping it around your fingers and your hands and saying, I should have done something with it, but instead I just stuck it on here. So, vain traditions become vain traditions by what you do with them and make them into something that they're not. Sometimes Christmas can be that way, sometimes other holidays as opposed to holy days. And so we could do the same thing in the Word of God today if we didn't realize that God wants us to hear the Word of God. He wants us to think about the Word of God. He wants us to understand the Word of God, but He also wants us to realize Jesus is the Word of God. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That means you should be reading 
listening and thinking about these words as though Jesus is speaking to them. Because he is. He's called the lawgiver. We're told that he was there in the beginning. We're told that every word that God spoke, Jesus spoke. So, this is, when we read it, Jesus speaking to you. There's no doubt about it. There's no mistaking. There's no misinterpretation. There's no mishandling of the word of God. The verb itself, the word itself is being spoken to you. The noun is going into you. It is accomplishing its purpose by way of the Spirit of God giving you ears to hear what the Spirit would say by giving the Spirit of God the opportunity to speak it forth to you, by giving those who have this word of faith and get all confused about all these words that they're speaking that they don't understand because they're trying to take something out of Judaism and apply it to man in some kind of evangelical way that's Pentecostal and they get carried away, is that really it is life, but it's life in heaven. Now it brings life on earth as the Spirit of God gives it life, but it can't do anything of itself because you could literally sit down and you could sit and read this book and you'll be totally confused. Even by the part we just read, verses 1 through 4. Won't mean anything to you at all. You won't get nothing out of it. Matter of fact, you just sit there and could go, Huh, I read it. It didn't give me life. Matter of fact, didn't condemn me either. So there, nah, 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 nah. I'm going to heaven. No, you're not. <laughs> not unless Jesus says so. So, hey, I tell you, you know, you got a lot of ideas, but you know what? You ain't going to go. No, 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 no. But the reality of it is, is that in here we have life, the Word of God. Jesus is in us, and as he's speaking through me to you, you have life because you're hearing the words of life. They're feeding you. They're, they're causing you to learn something. And you have to think. You have to put on your thinking caps, as Romper Room used to say. You have to kind of like do the magic little wand, which I don't know what show that was from, but some other TV show that was for kids. You know, and I don't even know what they have nowadays. Maybe they have put on your 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 iPads, you know, I don't know. But even an iPad would have to have a God pad in it, or so the God burst would have to come through the iPad to speak to you and you'd hear it. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And the way that we do that is that we hear it, but we think about it. Is that hearing meant to take in and comprehend and to understand it? So that's why we're taking our time to look at it a little closer. To say, yeah, okay, I get the words, but what, what's meaning? How does this apply to me today? What is it really going to do for me so that I can be a part of this thing we call Christianity? How does it fit in my life in a practical world? For I would have you know the great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea. Paul cared. That's what it means. That's all it means. Paul cared. He cared so much that he wanted to encourage the people at Laodicea, and he wanted to encourage the people that were here in this church that we call those that were at Colossea, but those that were not going to church that were at Colossae. Because if we look back at verse 1, we see that it says, or in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't just those that were at church, which is the saints. It was those that were outside of the church, the faithful brethren. In other words, it didn't matter where you went or how you were or what you did. If you were faithful, you're the faithful brethren. Or if you were a saint, God knows there's some people out there that act like it, don't they? <laughs> Inside the church and outside the church. You know, you know if you're a saint or not. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I mean, even some people, you know, I mean, they're, they're just good people. Well, if you're a saint, you know the Lord Jesus Christ and grace be unto you. And Paul cared about these people. He's expressing that in verse 1 of chapter 2 by saying that, hey, I have great concern for you. I have great care. I have great love. And that's what he's trying to say. I love you. But most men, you know, we don't have that ease to say something like, love. We say, I love you, baby, if I like you, because you know what? I want to see what I can get from you. <laughs> That's my kind of love. But we don't easily say as men, I love you, when we mean it. Because it feels like something's coming out of us that's giving it to you. And it is. You see... If I say I love you, and I mean it, oh, 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 my heart, 
my emotions, my feelings. I'm opening them up to you. I'm saying something that gives you the opportunity to connect with me. Love from the heart. Love from God. Because in reality, if God is in us, if God is right in some mystery that we don't understand of the grace that we've been given, of some supernatural thing that goes beyond the natural, which is why it's called supernatural, by the way. Supernatural. Natural is what you see, touch, and feel. But supernatural is like, whoa, that's, ooh, awesome. That's something beyond even ghosts, you know, and ghostbusters and ghost experiences. That's God. If we can really understand the heavenly reality of God in us, my words then have life. My words have death. My words have meaning. There's something important about me and what I say. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, God treats that so serious, He even warns us about what we say. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <gasps> hmm. Maybe I better hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Because I don't want that in my heart. I want to say things that give life. I want to do things that help people. I want to care, like Paul's saying to care in verse 1, when he's saying, here's my heart. I love you. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, for them at Laodicea, and for those that I have great conflict for, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. I can't help but think, what would happen if we really could take a sewing kit? You know, have you ever had a grandmother? I mean, it's usually grandmothers, it's not mothers too often, but you see some mothers do this. But you know, they have these long sticks, you know, they take... <laughs> I'm sure I'm not going to find two sticks laying around here. <laughs> but they take two sticks like this, you know, and they go, and they got this little thing, you know, and they wrap it around, you know, and they go, nee, 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 nee. and they get this long blanket. You know what I mean? You know, you've probably been given one of those kind of like things you threw away, or maybe you have one you love, you know, it's like, ooh, man, you know, and you don't, you resent the idea of somebody throwing one away. But, you know, you kind of knit these things together, you know, and you kind of knit one, cur or you curl it over, and you pull it through, and it pulls through, you know, and you kind of, you know, and you got this ball of yarn, you know, and your grandmother made you one, you know, and it was like, oh, so warm, and you loved it when you got it, and then later on, you know, you kind of bought one at the store, you know, and you didn't really care about it, but the one that grandma made, you know, with her own hands, that kind of had special meaning until you finally forgot all about it, you know. When you first got it, it was like your first love, wasn't it? It was kind of exciting, and you, you enjoyed it, and it was like really powerful to you. You kind of felt like, oh man, this is like grandma's way of saying, I love you. Oh, she knit her heart into that blanket. By her own hands, she was doing something that kind of like, you know, weaved in and kind of like connected them all together into such a way that it became a blanket and it held together and when I wrapped it around it kept me warm and I could feel as it were my grandma's love the love that she had when she made this blanket I could just oh cuddle into it and oh from the cold I just feel so much warmer now and it's almost as though grandma were here though she be departed that's what being knit together in love is like we have forgotten so much because of our machinery and our technology. We don't know what it's like really to get down to the nitty gritty and make something with our hands. Remember the first ashtray? I mean, that didn't go so well, did it? After that, you gave up on it, right? And went out and bought things for your parents and for your loved one and your spouse and everyone else in the house or far away. But really, there's something special about when God uses his own hands. Matter of fact, every man understands this principle very well. You see, man was formed out of the dust by God. God created man. But the woman, God fashioned with his own hands. 
And there's something mystical, there's something magical, there's something supernatural about women because God used his own hands. Now, to me, that's amazing. It's like, wow, God got his hands on my woman. <laughs> Pervert? No, <laughs> some of you are. <laughs> I know you're sinners. But no, you're fashion informed if you're a woman. I mean, a you know, man, you're, you, know, you know what you look like. <laughs> God, you know, put the clothes on, please. Ah, big leaves, please. But woman, beautiful, conformed by God from the rib of man or from the side of man to make perfect a helpmate to be with man. Another half of the heart that in three parts would be made whole. Because you see, a heart with nothing in it has nothing in it. But when God, who is love, comes in it, then your heart is full of love. So the heart is that empty space that you have inside that you've been going through all of your life seeking to find what's missing inside. It's not found when you get married. Oh, you thought you loved, but you loved like you love your cat. Some people love cats more than they love their wives, or dogs, or husbands, or kids. They love their animals more than they love people. Me, yeah, I love my pet, or I love my plants more than other people. Just kidding, just kidding. Somebody could take me serious. It's actually stuffed animals, really. I like them better. Easy care, you know. Well, anyway, so we'll go there. But the missing part is in your heart. The missing part is a hole here that God fills up to overflowing. God is love, and he comes down in a splash that goes into that vacuum inside and goes whoosh and splashes out that you're meant to love everyone. And that's the point of Colossians. You're meant to be knit together in love, literally, with everyone. God so loved the world. God didn't so condemn the world. He didn't say, hey, you know what? I've watched you and you just screwed up the last time. I've had it. Dude, it's over. Busted. Chomp on. Stomp on. You're done. You're toast. Ah, oh, that's the line from Satan. If you've got an enemy, you've got somebody out there that's really trying to knock you down and pull you down, it's not people with their mouth. It's somebody behind the scenes that pulling their tongues. Yeah, really. They got a little, you know, a little. You didn't know this, but there's a little jockey thing here. You know, that's why they call it Adam's apple. It's a little jockey thing that you know Satan gets a hold of it, starts going nee, 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 and go, and you start spewing out all this garbage that you go, where'd that come from? Well, part of it's in your heart. Part of it's Satan tempting you to say those things. He's pulling the strings, you know, and. You haven't cut those strings off yet. You know, your vocal cords are being yanked by guess who, and you know who, because it ain't good for you. But God wants you to be knit together in love with his fulfillment. And the only way that you can do that is by having something in your heart that can come out of you to everyone else around you. Because if you got nothing in your heart, can I tell you the truth? You don't love. <laughs> You're one of those foolish people that wander around saying, Yeah, I don't like you, but I love you. Yeah, well, you take your like and your love and you hit the road, Jack, because <laughs> you ain't coming back around my door no more. <laughs> uh -uh. I don't do with that like and love stuff. You know, you go somewhere else and grow up. <laughs> of course you can't like someone unless you love them. And of course you can't love someone unless you like them. Because you got to grow in it from the God who's given you the love in the first place. You grow, 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 grow. And the plant goes, woo, woo, woo. The plant's going to grow anyways. But, you know, if I water it and I love on it and say, Oh, you beautiful thing, you beautiful, beautiful darling. You're so marvelous. It'll grow like crazy. Well, okay, maybe not that. But, you know, it'll grow. And if I treat it right, it'll grow more. God has given us his word so that we would grow more so and know how our spiritual life would grow even more so in a more excellent way. And that excellent way is what Jesus came here today to say to you. He wanted you to know that I love you. Like Paul says, I love you. You're one of my faithful brethren. You're one of my saints. I love you. I, I got a word for you. I want to. I want to knit my heart with yours. I want to take this cross, this stick over here, and I want to take your cross, your stick, you know, and I want to knit between us your experiences of life, so that together we'll go through life. And yeah, it's gonna hurt. 
Because those sticks, man, they're going to pull at your heartstrings. They're going to kind of wrap you this way and twist you that way. But you're going to be entangled with me. You're going to be knit eventually to see that there's a pattern to your life. It's become a blanket. It's become this enveloping thing that I call my grace for you. My mercy for you. My love for you. I'm entangling my life with you. I'm knitting my life into yours. I am woofing and I'm weaving and I'm coming into your continual presence so that in the church and in the steeple you'll see up at the door and see all the peoples that will be bound together in a heart of love that always it'll be about God above and you'll always know this love because I died for you. I gave myself for you. You're mine. I own you so that I can bless you. So that I can make you to see, I want to lift you up to my Father, so that you can be with Him. And so, Colossians is all about that. Paul is saying that to us. We look at verse 2 and we find so much beauty and joy in being knit together in love unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. That is what I just said. That great mystery that God loves you. That's a mystery to me. <laughs> I'm glad you got understanding of that because I have no idea why God loves you. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, I really do. I know why God loves you. Because you're lovable. Yeah, you really are. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, you're not. You're rotten to the core. But you see... He loves you because Jesus died for you. Now, why Jesus loves you, well, you know, he saw good in you. <laughs> well, not really. It's not why he died for you, but there's good because God is good. And when God comes in you, good is there. Guess what? That's where it comes from. There is no good except to be of God and it's from the Father in heaven. But God loves you so much that he didn't just give his son for you, but he said, hey, I got more. It's not just enough to be saved. I've got continual salvation going on. So when you sin, I got you covered. When you blow it, I got it. When you blow it, I already knew it. It's not like I don't know it. It's like I've already planned for it. And guess what? You're going to make it all the way. And that's kind of why it's such a mystery we see when we're reading this in verse 2 about the full assurance of understanding. Because God wants to make known to you the mystery of who he is. This unraveling story that began in Genesis and it's going to tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, all the way through the clock until the end of the age when we find out perfect. The scales were just. God wasn't mad at us in the Old Testament and loves us in the New Testament. God loved us in the Old Testament and he loves us in the New Testament. God's ways are perfect and just and we'll be able to say, Perfect and true are thy ways, O Lord, as all the angels in heaven declare, and the church does when it gets there. We're amazed by this mystery that is of Christ, because it's not of Jesus alone, but it's of being that propitiation. The Christ is always used in the words when it means to be the sacrifice for sin. The one who died and rose again. The one who paid for your sin and the stain of the price of the payment that you can't pay for every time you do sin again. God has taken care of that and reconciled it to himself, as we saw in chapter 1. But Paul is reminding us of that in the full assurance so that we would know this. We'd be confident of it because we know we beat ourselves up with it. We know that we don't always believe in it. We know that we have doubts. But the mystery is God doesn't care. God does not, pardon the expression, give a damn about your lack of faith. What he cares about is that you will be there at the day of salvation to give him glory and honor for what he's done with you. Because he loves you, he's bringing you through it. He chose you because he knows you. Period. He didn't choose you because he could use you. He chose you because he knows you and he knows you can't do it on your own. He only uses those people that can't do it on their own. He doesn't call the righteous to repentance, but the sinner to salvation. As a matter of fact, the righteous have their own criteria with which they have to answer for. And if they come and present their righteousness before God, good luck on that one. Let me know how that works out for you. Because I don't know what God will do with them. I know what the Word of God tells me God will do with them. 
but I still yield myself to lay down myself before a holy God and say, God, you know, have mercy on me, a sinner, but you know, have grace upon them and forgive them, for they know not what they do, no matter how righteous and true they may be. Because who knows that God might not save them to the uttermost? Now, I do believe that there are those who have rejected God completely, and because they've rejected the name, the only name with which any man could be saved, Jesus Christ, that they have committed that sin that there is no forgiveness for. The rejection of what the Holy Spirit had been doing all their life by talking to them, walking with them, working on them, convicting them and convincing them, by changing them and trying to make them and rearrange them into something that God could use, and they rejected that, then they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit from what he was meant to do. And so they're forever condemned in the lake of fire and to hell. in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, it's easy to make up a religion. Ask the Mormons. I mean, you can ask the Mormons, you can ask the Muslims, you can ask even Jude lots of Judaism. Boy, there's, there's so many sects of Judaism that are made up that's just unbelievable. <laughs> you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> Same thing in Catholicism. There's some weird sects that are in Catholicism that aren't saved. I mean, Blue Army is a good example, you know, kind of some Mary Knoll stuff, you know. Sorry, no, they've rejected salvation. They think they're going to be saved in another name. Unfortunately, same thing is true in Confucianism. Same thing is true in Scientology. Same thing is true in many other good things or things that people think have wise sayings or have some kind of knowledge or some kind of, yeah, knowledge, some kind of wisdom, some kind of, you know, thing that they think is important to them, you know, that they've learned from science, or they've learned from the arts, or they've learned from, you know, philosophy, or they've learned from psychology. And let me add something here, so you understand perfectly clear what I'm saying. I have no problem with psychology, with sociology, with other religions, with all these things, if they bring you to that place of getting to know Jesus at some point in time in your life. I don't say you got to give up what you're doing. I mean, hey, if you're a Mormon and you like being in a Mormon church and you're going to stay in a Mormon church, get Jesus involved. Because trust me, you're getting into some wrong territory. If you're in a Muslim, talk to God. You know, because God will tell you about Jesus and get Jesus involved in your life. Because that's the one that you need to reconcile. Now, what you do after that is between you and God. You can go be a Muslim if you want to. I don't care. That's between you and Jesus, not me. Huh. I have no idea what you're going to do. Or you're a philosopher, or you're a Scientologist, or you're some other person in some other way, in some other form, or some other shadow of things that somehow brought your mind from wherever it was, how messed up it might have been. You might have been delivered to drugs through some yoga, or some est, or some, you know, Eastern Occidental religious kind of experience. But at some point in time, get Jesus, because you won't get to heaven. Because if you don't have Jesus in you, if you don't have Jesus for you, if Jesus isn't going to stand up and swear to God before the holy court in heaven, when the time comes and your name is called, then you will go to hell for all your good intentions and good ideas of what you thought was knowledge, which really became the foolishness of man. Because in reality, what we're told here in verse 3 is that in Him, God our Father, is not only the mystery and not of Christ, but are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's why James has told us so often in one five to, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask a father, ask of the Father who will braid it up and give it to him liberally. Because, to put it bluntly, if I said that too fast, let's go slower. James one five says, if any man or woman lack wisdom. Let him ask of the Father, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. See, I can go slow. Just can't keep my hands steady. But seriously, James tells us that if we don't know, we can ask God. I mean, you may not get the answer like what you think of as drive through You know, like, okay, well, I need an answer right now. Here's the question. Yes or no? Well, that kind of answer you'll get. Yes or no immediately. You know, you can get an immediate yes or no. Trust me, God will answer yes or no immediately. If you're asking some other question, it might take a little time. God might take his time to explain it to you. 
Or if he tells you on the yes and no to wait, you know, that happens. Or sometimes like silence because he's waiting for you to ask again or to see if you really mean it because you might be faking it, you know, to make it, you know, and that God's going to make you wait on it because he's not being honest with him to ask him a question. But frankly, James 1.5 is true. Any wisdom you want, you can get from God. Eventually, he will tell you. You'll see it. You may not believe it. He'll tell you. You may not accept it. He'll reply. You may not understand why. But he will, in some form, fashion, or manner, answer you and give you wisdom. Now, what you do with that, that's going to make you wise or stupid, depending upon how you deal with wisdom. Wisdom isn't always justified over children. Wisdom is sometimes only exemplified by what you do with wisdom when it's been given to you from God. And that's what we do with the Word of God. It's only as good as you get it, and as you give it, and as you live it. Because if you don't get it, then you don't got it. So if you don't got it, you can't live it, and you can't give it. But once you got it, the wisdom of God from the Word of God, then you begin to live it so that you could give it. In other words, you live out what you're learning from each day understanding what God is speaking to you in the Word of God that day. Whatever little bits you know is all you're responsible to go with. You don't need to know more than you can go or be allowed to flow with or know. Because you only know what you know. What you don't know, you're not responsible. You're accountable, but not responsible. <laughs> we won't go there on that one. Some other time we'll explain that. That's the mysteries of God, you know. But the mysteries of wisdom and knowledge is that because we can go to God, he says, there's no reason you don't know. Of course you know. Romans was written by Paul to tell us every man has known God at some point in time. Here we're told the mysteries of God are in him. Of course God is saying, come to me. Of course God is saying, I can give you wisdom. Of course God is saying, I can give you knowledge. Of course God is saying these things are in me because the wisdom and knowledge are two parts of the Holy Spirit that are technically the seven spirits that are before the throne of God, but also are maybe part of God because it's the Spirit of God. And so in some respect, in some ways, the Spirit of God being that some of the gifts of the Spirit are the gift of wisdom and the gift of understanding and the gift of knowledge. Hey, guess what? You've got from God, in God, that part with which God is a part of. So when God comes in you, you've got knowledge and you've got wisdom. Did you get that? No, you didn't got it. <laughs> I know, because it's hard to live it when you got it, you know, if you go with it, unless you really understand the flow of it. So, don't you know it? <laughs> but the fact is, without being too goofy, I, what I said was really spiritually true, very, like, woo, you know, kind of cool, because I was like, yeah, I'm going with that one. I'm going, yeah, baby, I'm all into this one, because it's like, my heart is beating in sync with God. But, <laughs> pitter-patter, pitter-patter. What's the matter? Nothing, because I got God. But when we realize that He has the knowledge beyond us, then we don't have to fear. When we realize that He has the wisdom beyond us, we don't have to beat ourselves up. What we really have to do is look up and ask, could you fill my cup? Could you kind of tell me what I need to know? And then go with it. Because it's like if God says fear not, and he says often that throughout the word of God, what do we got to fear? God is near. God is in us. God is with us. God is for us. So the mystery of the knowledge that God wanted for Paul to communicate to the Colossians was very much exemplified actually in that verse that we read from the very beginning. You know, when he said in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus, which are called, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about grace. It's all about peace. You got it. Yeah. You. Right now. This moment. As you're watching. As you're listening. As you're hearing. Grace has been given you. And peace. From God our Father. Through the Lord Jesus Christ to you. Right now. Take it. Run with it. Enjoy it. Be a part of it. It is yours. It has always been there. It will always be there. Whether you understand it or not, whether you comprehend it or not, or whether you are able to pull it up from inside or somehow feel it from the outside, or whether you're able to comprehend it in the way that you should by having your mind always at peace, God has given you peace. Because he said unto you, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. I give you my peace. That is the kind of joy we should experience every day. That's the kind of relationship we should have with our Father. 
to know by the grace we've been forgiven, to know by the grace we are forgiven, and to know by the grace we shall be forgiven always, which was, which is, which ever shall be, perfect in God's sight, forgiven even when we blow it, even when we don't know it, even when we don't comprehend it, don't understand it. And that's what Paul wanted to come face to face and say, look, I know you don't get the words, but I want to I want to have a heart to heart. I want to talk with you face to face. I want you to understand this. I want you to get the the meaning of what grace really is. I want you to see it in my face. I want you to see it in my heart. I want you to know my heart beats like yours. I want you to see, hey, I'm a sinner too. I'm no perfect, righteous, and true. I'm just like you. I fail. I have faults. I have struggles, I have trials, I have tribulation. And yet God has made this mystery known to me so I can give to you that peace of God that passes all understanding, that by His grace and mercy, He's forgiven you. And you can enjoy that in your life and employ it in a way that will bring meaning and purpose all the days of your life. That you should live in Him and have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that you should not, well, okay, and then we're not doing verse 4, <laughs> be begot by enticing words, but that rather you should be able to know without any shadow of a doubt, without any fear or worry or concern about, or any anxieties or any frustrations or any perplexities that circumstances may come at you in your life, that because of he who's inside of you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So because you're in the world, you've got someone inside you that is so much greater, that has conquered the world and life itself, that has conquered death, that has said to you, I love you. I died for you. I have opened my heart to you. I have given you the way, but it comes from my heart. I've given you the truth, but here's where it starts. I've given you the life, but the life isn't about defending yourself. It isn't about comprehending yourself. It isn't about building yourself up. It isn't about living for yourself, but it's denying yourself, dying to yourself, taking up your cross, following me, and learning that your life comes through me. In me, you will have life. In me, you will have fulfillment. In me, as I give you my peace, you will have joy in me. I will present you faultless before my Father. And exceedingly joy-filled, I will dance and sing and laugh over you with love and excitement on the day that you come home to be with me. Take my hand. Walk with me. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'll do it. I'm the author. I'm the finisher of your faith. I am Jesus. I love you. Father, I thank you for this word. That God, I find in you huh, everything. I find in you my satisfaction. I find in you my joy, my peace, my love. I find in you, in everything I do, the way that is right instead of the way I think by power of might I might do in my own strength and find it's in my weakness that you are made strong. Oh God, I pray for those that are listening and watching that likewise as I have been blessed, they too might find rest in you. They might know you, Heavenly Father, in a more intimate and personal way than they ever have in their days before that they have come to this place today to hear your voice, to listen to your words, to hear you speak. O oh God Almighty, in what you have done, I thank you, and I praise you, and I bless you, Lord, for delighting in me, uh, such as I am, because of your Son, and such as he is, and for delighting in these, for such as they are, for you have given them your blessing of grace and peace, and you have said and proclaimed it unto them, in the words from verse 2 of this book that we've read and of these words that have been said and of what hearing we have heard and of this day that we have spoken them and they have become true in our life, we have received from you grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ and from you, Father. And I thank you. Amen. 
Wow. It's kind of nice to be blessed, isn't it? It's kind of nice to, uh, you know, <sighs> kick back and rest. Because, after all, you just do your best and pray that it's blessed. Jesus takes care of the rest. Doesn't get any better than this. God bless you. God keep you. Oh my God, may He shine upon you just in every moment of your life. Little tokens of spoken words that He says to you in some way that inspire you through your day. You should go out and see Him <laughs> in everything and in every way that He's prepared for you. For He has arranged it, conformed it, and made it into a form that if you would just open your eyes to see, open your ears to hear, and open your heart to receive, you would find God there. God will bless you if you seek Him with all your heart. Ask Him to. And He'll be there with you. Jesus will always be with you and never leave you ever again.